Welcome everyone um, to this Ecosystex Insight Series webinar number seven. Sorry for the slight delay, but now, now we're here and we're ready to start the webinar. And we're excited that this session for the first time has a thematic focus on bio-based materials. And uh, at the beginning, I would just like to remind you of our webinar procedures. So be aware that this webinar is being recorded. So if you don't want to be seen or heard, please keep your microphone and camera disconnected at all times. Um, if you have a question, please type them in the chat. And if you would like to elaborate on a question, please raise your hand and we will invite you to speak. Here you can see the agenda for today. So I will start with a introduction to what Ecosystex is. And then afterwards, the Circular and Bio-based Europe joint undertaking CBEJU project officer will present you their funding priorities for 2024 and introduction, which is then followed by uh, three Ecosystex member project um, presentations. So first we will have Fipson uh, introducing itself, followed by Biolush, and then the Glaucos project will present its latest achievements, and in the end, we will have a Q&A, and I will wrap up and point out some future events that might be of interest to you. So if you're here for the first time, you might, might, might wonder what actually is Ecosystex. So Ecosystex is the European Community of Practice for a Sustainable Textile Ecosystem. And our objectives are threefold. So for one, we want to foster inter-project collaboration and bring together the knowledge and the experts across Europe, um, which work together on textile sustainability and circularity. Our second objective is to enhance engagement with policymakers, to support them in, the, in their decision and policy making by providing them with expert input. And the th third goal is dissemination, just like this Insight Series webinar, with, um, yeah, which you're currently in, um, to ensure that an interested public can be informed what is going on in the technical work of the projects. On this slide, you can see Ecosystex in numbers. So it's been one year since we launched the community in early 2023. And our community grew over time. Right now we have 28 member projects, which in total um, have a budget of 167 million euros, which is quite impressive. Our community has over 175 registered experts that work together in six different working groups. And we um, organize, as I mentioned before, dissemination activities like these seven public webinars we had so far. And there was also one um, public input paper that we published last summer. And as the working groups are currently very busy, we expect more publications to come this year. And another dissemination activity we did was our first Ecosystex conference, which we organized in Barcelona in October. And we're currently starting the planning of our second one. So now I already mentioned our projects a couple of times. So here you can see all of them on one slide. And these three are um, focused on bio-based material projects and which and will be presenting today. So without much further ado, I would now like to invite um, the project officer of the CBEJU, Simona, who is, who is here to, to take over the floor and start off um, our webinar. I think. Thank you, Tila. I'm going to share my presentation. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Can you see it in presentation mode? Perfect. Yes. Thank you. So uh, my name is Simona Macaferri. I'm project officer at CBJU, and I'm the person that is responsible for the uh, cluster of uh, projects dealing with the textile sector. So I'm 
the person that is following the exercise steps in CBJU. Uh, for who doesn't know uh, CBJU yet, CBJU is the uh, Circular Biobased Europe Joint Undertaking. It is a joint undertaking composed by the European Commission and the private partner that is the Biobased Industries Consortium. And is a two, bi uh, two billion euro public-private initiatives that is uh, um, contributing to the objective of the European Green Deal, is part of the Horizon Europe program, uh, and uh, it has been launched in 2021 in order to support projects that are dealing with uh, sustainability, circularity, development of bio-based solutions that are able to uh, provide competitiveness in Europe in a, a meaningful, innovative, sustainable and equitable uh, way. Um, we have uh, uh, over 160 projects that has been funded so far, uh, thanks to our predecessor BBIJU. And last year, in uh, with the fall 2022, we started funding projects in Horizon 2020, uh, in Horizon Europe. Sorry. Uh, and today we are going to uh, learn more about uh, two of the projects that uh, started in uh, 2023, uh, that are Fibsan and Biolash. Uh, so far, CBJU uh, funded a number of projects in the textile sector. Uh, uh, Greater Neocell, Biolash, Glaucos and Fibson, the three latter one uh, will be presented today, are uh, research and innovation action. But we had also a demo project with either TRL like effective unlock or biomotive and effective, for example, has also been part of ecosystems uh, and contributed to the activities of the platform in the in the uh, past uh, period. Um, today, I'm going to uh, highlight you uh, some potential opportunities that are uh, present in the annual work program 2024 that uh, we have just launched at CBJU. Uh, the annual pro world program for 2024 will be opened uh, officially on, in April, uh, but uh, we have just published on our website uh, the uh, draft version of the world program in order that uh, consortium can start working on, on these uh, possible opportunities. And as you can see, there are four, uh, four topics that are dealing with uh, uh, the textile uh, in a very strong way or to some extent. Uh, first uh, topic that I want to highlight you is a flagship, is a big uh, first of a kind uh, biorefinery project that has a substantial budget of 20 million euro. The end TRL for this project uh, is TRL 8, and uh, we are going to ask the implementation of environmentally and economically sound value chain for biorefined application based on a natural fiber feedstock. Uh, here we ask for the establishment of an industrial fiber crop production system from non-woody or wood-based fibers, and to demonstrate in other biorefinery process for the production of garment application, technical textile, or non-wovens. So uh, you can see that the, the scope for the textile sector is extremely relevant. Uh, then there are also in, uh, other uh, topics that are uh, dealing with the uh, textile uh, sector. For example, there is an innovation action called Bio-Based bio Materials and Products for Biodegradable in-soil application. In this case, we are going to fund two projects with a budget of 7.5 million euros for each project. Is an innovation action that, and the TRL is 7 to 8. And here we are asking to demonstrate and deploy the innovative production process for sustainable by design bio-based product that are biodegradable in soil and the focus in the textile sector is on the geotextiles. Then we have also two research and innovation action, smaller project, 3.5 million euro budget, where the end TRL asked is four to five. The first one is uh, CB uh, 2024 RIA2. And in uh, these topics, we are going to ask to develop biotech routes for the design of sustainable bio-based alternative to animal-derived product. Uh, also in this case, there are um, a quite a substantial interest for the textile sector because the example of the target industries that are mentioned in the topic text uh, 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 includes also the textile and the leather industry. Uh, 
beside the application, for example, in cosmetic ingredients and chemicals. Um, the last topic that uh, I would like to uh, highlight as uh, potentially relevant uh, deal uh, with the coating. Uh, coatings are uh, extremely, extremely important in the textile industry, and the RIA4 is also a project with a budget of 3.5 million and an end TRL of 4 to 5. And the objective is to develop innovative and efficient process to obtain a sustainable bio design, bio based alternative to conventional coatings that can be applied in demanding or extreme conditions. Since the textile sector is going to use uh, a demanding uh, um, quality of coatings, uh, it, it is an example of the target industry that is mentioned in the topic text. So you can see that we are going to look uh, at four topics where for sure the community of ecosystems is particularly uh, relevant for us and therefore uh, I, I, I hope that we will uh, populate uh, this interesting community of practice of new projects that are going to contribute uh, substantially to the objectives of the platform and to the objective of CBJU uh, in first. Uh, of course, uh, I gave you very short, uh, very short uh, information uh, on these topics, but please note if you are interested that uh, on 23rd of April here in Brussels and online, uh, there will be the CBJU Info Day where the topics will be extensively presented and there will be an opportunity for networking and to develop uh, consortia and opportunity for uh, create uh, new projects in this topic, but also in all the other uh, that are uh, contributing to the annual work program 2024. That's all from my side. I thank you, um, Tila, for the organization of this webinar and the colleagues from uh, Biolash, Fibsan and Glaucos for participating and showcase their uh, interesting projects. Thank you. Thank you, Simona, for this overview. And exactly like you mentioned, um, I would like to now invite Christina from the Fibson project to please take over the floor and introduce us our work, your work. Okay, good morning, everyone. So I'm I'm Christina from Finland, and I present uh, the project Fibson, which is on novel fiber value chains and ecosystem services from sustainable feedstocks. And in this presentation, I will concentrate on this exciting purple plant here. Uh, you will hear more about that. But first, the basics about the project. So we are developing fiber based products for the construction, automotive and textile sectors. And we are 17 partners and the coordinator is Natural Resources Institute Finland. And our biomass types are hemp, wood, cardoon, cattail and common reed. And we optimize the processing technologies like the physical, chemical and biotechnological biotechnolo uh, treatments to obtain fibers. And the final products that we are testing are insulation rolls and boards, composites for car industry, bioconcrete and textile yarn. Uh, but the very core of our, of our project is also uh, the environment and the soil, especially. I'm actually a soil scientist, so not, not uh, so much aware of all uh, processing um, opportunities of, of the fibers. But my motivation here was to uh, create use for plants that can improve soil conditions. And um, we also measure the, the environmental impacts of our our uh, crops. And the idea was that uh, these crops are suitable for somehow degraded soils, which can be improved with this new type of cropping. Uh, maybe I here mentioned just the budget, which is four and a half million, and we started last year and will end in 2027. And 
This map shows where we are. So the coordination is in Finland. Uh, the work package uh, on fiber processing is led from Sweden. Uh, then uh, one type of coating is, is tested uh, in a company in, uh, in, in the UK. Then we have uh, the value chain on cattail and uh, the VP uh, on soil and environmental monitoring led from uh, the Netherlands. Then our value chain analysis and hemp production is done in Germany. In France, we have the, the value chain for, for wood fibers and bioconcrete uh, uh, production, and then uh, uh, the, the testing and, uh, yeah, well, uh, experimenting the, uh, the insulation uh, products in, in Soprem. Uh, in Italy, we have uh, the, the composite value chains and in Greece, uh, we have a partner doing uh, process optimization using artificial intelligence and our textile value chain is in, in Portugal. And you will hear more about that later. This is the concept. You can see the, hemp, uh, the feedstocks here and the, the products that we are testing. From hemp, we are going to produce insulation products and composites from wood, bioconcrete. Uh, we have the, the wood fibers from uh, wood grown on uh, polluted soils uh, tested in here. Uh, then the, the plant I showed in the uh, beginning was, was cardoon, and that's what we use for textile yarns. And then common reed and cattail for insulation boards. And I was looking at the statistics about fibers in textile industry, and I was actually uh, surprised that 60% of the fibers come from uh, syn uh, uh, synthetic fibers and 22% of cotton, and those are the main fibers, and both have some, well, there are some environmental concerns on them. And now I think our uh, alternative fibers coming from new crops, they, they mainly would be in this category other. So they would uh, most likely replace cotton in, in products. And it seems that there is really room for new sustainable alternatives. And uh, I think the consumers are actually very much asking for that. So it, it's really interesting how how the the industry will develop develop from from now. And now we get to this uh, cardoon plant. It looks like tistel, if you know that word uh, better. The Latin name is Skinner uh, cargundulus. Uh, it's a very high perennial plant. It's actually edible. It's been used in food products. Uh, it's very much favored by pollinators with these big flowers. And uh, the improve, the potential improvement of soil it has been shown in many uh, scientific articles. Uh, I have just a couple of quotes here. So uh, nice uh, root material, which uh, uh, which has the potential to increase uh, the soil carbon content. And then it has been used also in uh, in soil uh, cleaning and fitter, fitter remediation and in many other uh, uh, applications too. And it's especially suitable for uh, dry soils, for, for uh, the Mediterranean soils that are at risk of desertification. And that's the reason why we were interested. If there are really uh, regions where the soils are in bad condition, this is a plan that can help these soils to revive and maybe also to, to, to be turned to a more traditional agriculture later. And uh, we know something about the fiber quality. Uh, it looks like it is uh, well suitable for many applications. Uh, they, uh, they have a good tensile strength and also flexibility. 
uh, they can be woven. Uh, I, I guess they are usually used in as blended with other materials, also uh, in textile and composite materials. It's lightweight, of course, biodegradable, uh, and well, uh, it is basically available, but of course the uh, cropping is not common yet. Uh, this is the scheme of the value chain we are we are testing. So the research organization Food for Sustainability is responsible for uh, the farming and cultivation tests. Uh, they have done the first harvest already, so they will separate the plant parts and then uh, experiment different uh, processes for producing the, the fibers. And uh, then uh, the textile company, Tierfill Textile Yarns, will use these fibers in their uh, full scale facility. Uh, they will mix it uh, as the first step, they will mix it with cotton and they will uh, test the different uh, options for making uh, uh, yarn. So that's the very thin textile yarn type of of yarn that we are aiming at. Here are some uh, facts about this company. Uh, it was founded in 1973 and um, since 2000 they have had their own laboratory for R&D work. So it's a very nice, um, nice partner in this, in this project. Uh, this is just for fun. I trialed the chat GPT. I was asking it, what can you make from cardoon? And you can see that it's actually uh, very much food, <laughs> food oriented. Uh, so many kinds of food, but also medicine and textiles. You can uh, see it surrounded here. So, so textile innovations are, are there to be found and uh, implemented in industry. So that was everything about FIPSOM project and please ask if you, uh, if you are interested and of course uh, uh, you can always uh, email me and, uh, and we are open for any kind of cooperation. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Christina, for your presentation. And um, as she already mentioned, if you have any questions to the FIPSON project, please type them in the chat and yeah, mention that it's addressed to, to Christina. And uh, we will take them at the end of this webinar. And uh, now we will have our second project presentation by Alexei, who I invite to take over the floor. Yes, hello, everyone. Let me share my presentation. Can you see it? Yes, not yet in presentation mode, but I can see your PowerPoint. Perfect. Yep. Yep. So, um, hello uh, from my behalf, and thanks for for the invitation. So, uh, I am uh, Alexey Hakala, senior scientist at VTT Technical Research Center of Finland, and I will be presenting the BioLash uh, project on behalf of the whole whole consortium. So, the BioLash actually stands for the biomass valorization for sustainable and high quality materials. So uh, within this uh, project, we are actually trying to uh, build and demonstrate a reliable value chain, exploiting uh, the cell wall structure of underutilized and underexplored um, uh, biomass in Europe, uh, specifically targeting at forest residues, marine plants and weeds to extract high quality fibers. So our uh, feedstock in question is hemp, like in FIPSAN, <laughs> forest uh, residues and um, marine grass will 
focus on the eelgrass. And from the grasses, we will also work with, uh, with nettle. So this is a four year journey which started last uh, May with a budget of roughly four and a half million from the CB joint undertaking. So what uh, specifically we are doing and who, who are the partners? So the project is uh, led is uh, coordinated by uh, Stockholm's um, University as uh, one of the leading um, uh, research and development organizations uh, within the consortium. As you can see, we have uh, five uh, university type, three SMEs and uh, large, large companies. So as I already mentioned, the uh, coordination comes from the Stockholm University. Uh, also from Sweden, we have um, Swedish Environmental Research uh, Institute, we'll, which actually uh, supports all of the developments so within the project with sustainability assessment and business opportunities. Uh, the partner uh, from Switzerland, uh, EMPA, they are focusing on the novel and effective uh, biomass valorization routes. Uh, VTT is leading the task related to the fiber based uh, products uh, manufacturing, which are later will be upscaled uh, by the uh, companies which are present within the consortium. So we are dealing with the food packaging that comes from the uh, Unilever. Also as part of our uh, biomass uh, valorization step, we are uh, utilizing uh, enzymes and therefore in our value chain we have the company AB Enzymes uh, from Germany and also the Xylem. As part of our um, industrial board we have uh, Volvo which actually supports the development of impact resistant fiber based composites for the car interiors. And what is relevant for the textile value chain is uh, we have on board uh, SME from Finland called Spinova with their dry jet um, uh, technology to actually produce the textile fibers uh, directly from the microfibrillated cellulose grades, avoiding any dissolution stages. And uh, the partner in a sense is related to the disinformation activities of the of the project. So what are the uh, challenges and the objectives of the whole uh, BioLash project? So we were trying to actually secure the sustainable uh, biomass supply. And for that reason, we are actively co collaborating with the uh, farmers across Europe uh, actually to harvest and and collect uh, the residual biomass, which can be uh, utilized for the uh, high quality biomass, uh, high quality uh, fiber fiber products. And the same as Cardoon uh, plant uh, covered by Christina from the Fipsan, we are focusing on nettle, which is used to traditionally be used as a textile fiber like more than 100 years ago and this plant is also uh, capable of extracting uh, nitrogen from the contaminated or marginal uh, soils thus uh, reducing the eutrophication and nettle was also used uh, for for the food feedstock, I mean the leaves of, of nettle. Uh, so to make our value chain effective, we have not only to provide and collect the, the, the biomass, but we also have to develop an efficient valorization routes with lower carbon footprint 
and that's what our partner Empa with fiber plats are are in charge. So they are developing this uh, processing methods. And what comes to the objectives, we really want to uh, develop uh, flexible uh, processes for converting high value uh, biomass from secondary resources. And we are by doing this, we are trying to reduce the environmental impact. Uh, also, we are trying to facilitate the um, market entry of these uh, uh, plant-based high-quality fibers in the end applications such as uh, textile, uh, food packaging, and composites. Simultaneously reducing uh, the uh, reliance on uh, fossil resources and thus promoting uh, the uh, biofibrous economy in, in Europe. So just to have the big overview of the whole uh, project and maybe to use as a summary of what exactly we are doing here. So we are focusing on the forestry residues as one of our uh, feedstock uh, marine plants and we are from this we are focusing on hemp and nettle and from this biomass feedstock will develop uh, effective uh, valorization uh, concept to extract high quality fibers and nanofibers which will be uh, either pure as for the demand for the textile industry and also for another applications we are also considering um, holocellulose meaning that our cellulose will continue uh, some uh, some small contents of the hemicellulose and also lignin containing uh, fiber yeah, fiber fractions for for the composite developments so this uh, novel biomass feedstocks would be trialed in the textile value chain as antimicrobial uh, fabrics which would be scaled up and demonstrated by our partner Spinova from Finland. We will focus on the edible uh, packaging with our industrial partners Ema and Unilever and Volvo will support the development of uh, impact resistant uh, biocomposites and 3D printable uh, filaments. And within, uh, within the development of all of these uh, products, we will really build on, uh, on extensive uh, knowledge and research involving like mechanical, catalytic and enzymatic uh, disintegration uh roots of the of the biomass we will also work with the uh, water-based uh, colloidal uh, processes and melt compounding uh, to work with these uh, formulations to facilitate the fiber-based product development such as fiber spinning 3d printing uh, casted films and injection uh, molding and of course, we will target uh, the benefits for the society and and the environment. Uh, we are enhancing environment in Europe, European bio-based uh, sector through sustainable feedstock uh, processing for fashion, uh, packaging and automotive applications. Uh, we will uh, try to demonstrate that our uh, technology really facilitates the production of the greenhouse uh, gas emissions and reduce the dependence on the fossil fuels. We will try to decrease the carbon dioxide uh, emissions, also raise the consumer awareness on the effectiveness of our proposed um, uh, strategies and also make aware 
public and uh, EU policy uh, makers uh, to facilitate the carbonization uh, even in, in further. And as a result, we will introduce uh, new products and processes uh, to the to the market. Also supporting the economical uh, growth in rural and mar marginal areas. So to conclude, our project will contribute to the EU uh, policy and we are really focusing on the different um, initiatives which can be listed on, on this slide. So thanks for for invitation and hope you you are interested in our uh, developments and our project would be really easy to find in the internet so please uh, feel free to reach out to any of our uh, partners if you would have uh, further question questions or willingness to collaborate thank you very much Thank you very much, Alexei, for your presentation and introducing the BioLash project to us. And also for this project, um, I would just reiterate that if you have any questions to Alexei, please type them in the chat and we will address them during the live Q&A. And also, I know you might already want to answer some questions in the chat as a speaker, as you have some time on your hands, but we really try to address um, all of them during the live Q&A so that everyone can follow the, the conversation then. Great, thank you. And we are a bit ahead of schedule, um, but that's not a problem at all. Then we might have more time during the Q&A. Um, so, or Cohen has more time for his presentation. Yeah, and there he already is. Great. So yes, please take the floor. Okay, I just want to check if you can see the presentation as such. Yes, perfect, okay. in presentation mode. Good. Uh, thank you, Tila, for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. Um, my name is Koen van Goetem. I'm with iCode CEO. We're based in Antwerp, Belgium, and we are part of the Glaucos project. I'm going to highlight a little bit our achievements on bio-based coatings. Now, to start off, it's always interesting for those who haven't heard about Glaucos. It is a project which started in uh, 2020, in June the 1st, and it will take us four years. We are 14 partners and why Glaucos was chosen is that it is the Greek god of fishermen. He was commonly believed to protect the oceans as it is the ambition of this project by developing innovative alternatives for textiles that are currently polluting our oceans. I think everybody knows the litter which is entangling uh, a lot of species and we are seen in a negative uh, vision. That's why we try to change this. So our aim is to develop eco-friendly textiles as well for clothing as for fishing industry. And that's the European project. Sustainability of these textiles will be enhanced significantly and while textile performance should be matched to the end user requirements. And that's of course a topic which has been discussed within our consortium since it is actually a fact that we try to aim for the best possible fiber as well in clothing as in fishing on life cycle assessment and life cycle management but at the same time when it wears off that those microplastics would disappear so would biodegrade now the objectives um, are to increase the bio-based content of polyester on polyamide textiles to at least 50%, mitigate microplastic pollution as indicated by increasing the biodegradation, reconcile sustainability characteristics with performance and durability, 
to boost the biorecycling potential for textiles by developing recycling biocatalysts, develop eco-friendly coatings and overlay finishes with increased bio-based content over 30% and engage stakeholders across the industry. And why you see those 30% because otherwise we would participate in the area of greenwashing, which we don't want to do. Now the Glaucus approach is clear, and that's why we came up with this beautiful draft of a slide in which you see everything we want to do. Yeah, It goes from develop new methodology for LCA, circularity and plastic leakage, scale up production. If you go to the left, we boost the biorecycling by developing compatible biocatalysts. We want to increase the biodegradation rate of bio-based polymers. We want to reconcile the biodegradation characteristics with technical performance and durability of the overlay finishes and coatings. And we want to develop as well the eco-design polymers with increased bio-based content. Now, before I continue, um, I wanted to highlight a little bit that what we had to do is develop, which was mentioned, and testing bio-based overlay finishes and coatings, mitigate the micro microplastic pollution by increasing the biodegradation of the coatings, and of course, support the other work packages and engage stakeholders across our industry. Now to start off, we as a company, and I know you have, if you Google it, many different explanations and definitions on bio-based and biodegradation. Well, we came up with this one that on bio-based, we think that the product is partially derived from biomass or renewable organic material generated from plants or animals, cellulose chitin. By degradation, that's the process during which micro and other organisms convert material into water, CO2 and organic matter, driven by environmental conditions, material and use. And for that matter, we have of course some remarks as well. The bioplastic can refer to either bio-based or biodegradable or both, or biodegradable does not necessarily mean bio-based or compostable. Now the results we came up with so far, and we're actually closing in the end of our project, is that we did come up with bio-based overlay finishes and coatings. They have been developed for the application on fibers and netting, used in commercial fishing and aquaculture. Our bio-based content is above 30% as asked for. Actually, we aim in the market to go for 35, but the higher content would be possible to go up to 60%. And of course, that is the percentage of the active solids of our finishes and coatings. Now, there is a strong indication that by degradation in C, is also higher and consequently performance is also decreasing quicker, which is a topic which we had to discuss with the end users, because I think you know that if you want to provide a coating, what you want to do is actually protect the material as long as possible. So extend the life cycle management or um, for your products. Now, if and when we would come up with products where we can tell our customers, look, it is bio-based and for that matter, it will also biodegrade quicker. The question we receive back is, yeah, nice, but when? And that's a trigger. And for that, luckily we have our partners and I can share with you how we tested this to come up with results to actually reassure the end user that we will always provide them with a product which lasts as long as 
the subject as long as the rope and as long as the netting. So the bio-based overlay finishes and coatings, they're tested in our lab to come up with a similar or better performance on abrasion and mesh strength of netting as traditional coatings. And on ropes, you can see. Now, what you can see here is an equipment which we developed ourselves to test the ropes, three millimeter diameter in four positions to see the abrasion resistance against an Allen key. What you see here is our yarn on yarn testing device where you have the yarns actually giving a friction one to another in order to see, okay, what is the life cycle and the cycles to failure on four positions as well. This one is a tensile tester in which we test the mesh strength and to see if a coating is applied, will it actually protect the knot of a net longer than it should be without a coating. The last one over here at the right is actually to test the abrasion resistance against high pressure cleaning. So it's a device which everybody knows if you have an outdoor terrace when you want to clean it after a beautiful winter of humidity like we are experiencing in Belgium for the moment, then you want to clean all the fungi and algae. Well, we do the same on the netting and then you can see the difference on under here. What if we apply a coating, how long will it last? Because that is very important for a sector for which we test this, and that is the aquaculture. Talking of which, aquaculture by degradation, it should not have a negative effect, of course, on the performance for at least one season. Now, how we test this? So we took the bio-based coatings, we applied them on small that's as you can see here, and we hang them out in the field to see, okay, after how many, I would say, months, at first we talk of days, of course, then uh, you talk of months, and how long actually can these coatings stay on the nets and protect the net with, of course, an additive component, like you see here. This is without anything with copper, or as you can see, the HP1, was with a bio-based mass at first we tried five and then we went for 30 percent 35 if you want um, that's the same area and yes we do see a falling restraining effect which is positive and which of course is important for this industry of aquaculture as you remember in the beginning i talked about the possibility of biodegradation and the relationship in between having a bio-based coating or finish, because I've been talking about mostly the coatings. Now the finishes, they will be applied at fiber level before the fiber is twisted. It is applied to protect the fiber throughout the process of production. But as well, of course, as you remember seeing the yarn on yarn uh, abrasion resistant device to protect, of course, the um, fiber against friction and for that matter heating up and diminishing the life cycle. Now those two as well the fibers as the end products the nets or ropes were tested on end of life by the University of Vigo a partner of Glaucos project and tested on BOD the biochemical oxygen demand and this had led for them already to a publication which is public. Our coatings, they showed a higher biodegradation if we increased the biocontent. If you remember the slides which we provided you with on a definition, there is so actually a link if you increase your bio-based content in your coatings or overlay finishes, that's the product would biodegrade quicker. Now, that's a trigger for us to find out in this project still, because the leaching out is also very critical. If and when the project is, of course, on a bio uh, developing a biodegradable fiber, which then should 
biodegrade while in contact in seas and oceans, the question would be, okay, when? Because you can imagine if you're a fisherman, actually they're hunters, and you're out there uh, in the middle of the ocean fishing with nets the size of 1.5 or 2 kilometers, and all of a sudden your net is starting to biodegrade, you will lose your catch, and that's not what they want. So what we're looking for is to see how can we evolve from the total demand of having a biodegradable net towards a net which keeps as long as possible for the life cycle assessment of the used end user, but at the same time, if the coating is wearing off, which of course it does during the use, that those microplastics which become volatile in the oceans, that they would be actually biodegrading. And for that matter, if and when the protection is gone, that also the synthetic, or in this case, then the biodegradable fibers on the top layers of those nets will wear off as well, will be volatile and floating in the ocean, but will biodegrade as well. So you can imagine from the start of the project towards the evolution and uh, where we are now, we walked the, actually we walked the line together with all the partners um, in order to come up with results to serve the industry because that's still the key. And this is who we are, what we can do. You can find us on. LinkedIn, you can find us on our project webpage on Twitter. You can scan the QR code. We have already had a lot of stakeholder meetings. We will have some others in the end of this, towards the end of this year. And it is a pleasure to welcome you because the more we have, the more reactions we have. And um, we can always learn because what we see when we organize stakeholders meetings is that we love to share, but we even appreciate it more if we can get feedback or even advice from people working in this industry as well, and perhaps having the same issues or challenges. This is my presentation. And I would like to thank you. As you can see, the 14 partners are shown here and we are spread over the whole of Europe. There you go, Tila. Thank you very much for your for your presentation. And um, yeah, as mentioned before, also questions for the Glaucus project, Fibson and Biolash can be typed in the chat, chat now. Um, and then will be addressed by by the speakers. Um, so this is now now the moment for you to to think about your questions. I've seen that there are quite a few questions for the uh, Fibson project in the chat. And maybe Christina, I know you already answered some parts of it, um, but maybe you could just quickly elaborate um, on, on what you already mentioned um, concerning yeah, fiber properties, processing availability and so on, even though I, I read that colleagues of yours would be more suitable. So we will take that up in a future webinar for sure, but maybe you could just quickly, quickly elaborate on that. Yeah, OK, I'm sorry, I'm not the right person. I really uh, tried to get the fiber experts here, but they were not available. And I actually forwarded all your questions to the experts <laughs> just a, some minutes ago. And let's let's see if they if they reply. But anyway, um, I can I can tell you something. So. Um, if I understood right, I think they can the fibers can be called bust fibers. But um, yes, we'll we'll hear more about that. Uh, and uh, yes, I I can't answer the question about the length of the fibers. I guess uh, there is literature on that, but I haven't I haven't read all that yet. Um, 
but I, I'm, I'm excited about the sustainability aspect because uh, we know that, uh, I mean, the, the kind of the region where we try this now uh, in Portugal, there are many agricultural regions actually that are highly polluted and actually agriculture is not doing well there. Uh, farms are quitting and so on. So if they find a new crop, if there's uh, demand for a new crop that is uh, soil improving, even these, uh, these poor agricultural regions might uh, benefit from, from new jobs and uh, livelihood there. And uh, as this crop is also pretty, uh, it can be used for many kinds of applications, including uh, very traditional cheese production uh, as one example, and many kinds of food applications. So it's it's close to artichoke, actually. It has been used as uh, in similar foods like uh, the one of one of the artichoke types. So uh, there might be multiple companies actually utilizing the same plant uh, in kind of a cascade uh, processing, which which would be very good for these regions. And then again, there were some fiber questions. Uh, but I think I think uh, I would expect the similar kinds of harvesting, processing, and cultivation as hemp would be very appropriate. And uh, our uh, partner organization, uh, Food for Sustainability, has actually tried some of them. I, but I just don't know all the details yet. But we are of, of course collecting all the information on uh, the trial um, fields. So yields and uh, used uh, chemicals if they are needed and work work demand and that kind of things will be uh, recorded. Great, thank you. Thank you for elaborating, Christina. Um, I don't know if you if you already addressed this, but do you know by any chance what kind of textile products this cartoon yarn is used for? Uh, if I understand, understand right, it will be uh, a thin yarn that can be woven. That's the, the application. Uh, but what kind of <laughs> woven? Um, well, then I guess they really de haven't decided because then they will produce many kinds and many, uh, uh, yeah, well, many mixtures of, of cotton and this fiber and you might get different uh, uh, applications. Uh, we are going to uh, use this kind of uh, experimental textiles as we we will uh, well uh, showcase our products in a, a little midget house that we can take to different fairs and uh, and uh, conferences. And uh, we certainly will use these woven textiles for some interior uh, decorations of these midget houses. Great. That sounds exciting. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. And um, there is one question for Kuhn in the chat, um, which I will read out for, for you. So um, how much demand for such bio-based or biodegradable materials do you see in the market for ropes and nets? And what are the biggest market take-up barriers, technical issues or economics? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a handful. Um, from the start, actually, we've been going for a sort of push marketing. And uh, to be shy, perhaps you remember, in the slides, we started off with 5% just to see, okay, is there an interest? Now, what we've noticed is that as long as there won't be anything mandatory from the European Commission, that the demand for such bio-based and biodegradable materials is very low. Why? Because they are suspicious that the biodegradability, as explained, will happen actually whenever it will, and nobody can define it. And that's a risk they don't want to take. Now, as we are progressing in our project, we will be able to see the leaching out and make it perhaps more quantifiable 
than it is now. And we don't want to go for the highest amount possible of biodegradability, because then actually we would not help the end user or the industry. Um, the biggest market take up barriers uh, or technical issues or economics. Well, I think if you talk about bio and you go to the grocery shop 10 years ago, that was, let's say a tomato didn't look nice, but it was bio based and it was double the price of what you could buy from, an, I would say, normal grown um, vegetable. If you look now, the bio-based vegetables, if I continue in that sort, um, are looking more or less the same. They're tasting very well and their price is almost equal to normal uh, grown vegetables. We assume, because for the moment, indeed, it is still more expensive because it's development and the products which need to be uh, produced to have them in your bio-based mass are much more expensive than the regular ones which are available in the market. But it's the chicken and the egg. If and when we move forward, then we will have cheaper availability of bio-based um, uh, emulsifier dispersion agents and for that matter, the end product, the finishes and coatings will be accessible as well. So the two having not a mandatory uh, or legislation looking upon it are, and the second time the price is still quite high, it's not easy for companies like ourselves to move it into the market. But this said, 2024, people do follow Glaucos do follow what iCodes is providing them with in the market. We've set out already samples to towards customers. Why? And I think you remember uh, what we aim for is either a similar characteristic and performance than a regular uh, coating or finish, or even better. And we were actually able to improve while having bio-based content increase to become actually to come up with products which have better performance. Thank you for, for elaborating on that, that question, Kuhn. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a second one for you, but I will first take one for Alexei from Biolush. So, let's say, do you have more details about the antimicrobial textiles? Are these cellulosic fibers with a special bio-based finish or fibers with some kind of nanocellulose coating? Yes, thanks. Thanks for this question. Um, unfortunately, I cannot answer and provide any details because according to our plan, the antimicrobial fiber development only will start in may this year so the work simply hasn't started we're just building up and optimizing our line uh, although i can share the thoughts we will we had in mind during the drafting stage uh, so to bring the antimicrobial properties we were thinking to have to utilize actually the extractive from the nettle during the valorization process because according to the literature nettle already uh, contains some bio-based antimicrobial agent. So our idea is to, while we extract the high quality uh, nanocellulose fibers from it, we will have this uh, antimicrobial chemistry like a, a part, and that would be added to the nanocellulose uh, dope while during the formulation development to spin the fibers, the textile fibers uh, right away with the antimicrobial properties. So this antimicrobial agent will be introduced inside the dope. Alternatively, it can be designed as a fiber post-treatment step. So for instance, we uh, spin the textile fiber and then we dip it, for instance, in the, in the coating uh, bath uh, with this antimicrobial agent for the post-treatment step. If this approach is the bio-based route doesn't work, we have already demonstrated numerous 
other chemical functional, functionalization routes to bring the antimicrobial properties. And it's well known from the literature that uh, amine functionalities are really working great in this in this regard. So we might also either functionalize, uh, for instance, with quaternary ammonium groups, our nanocellulose, and then again either coating or formulation as a dope. Also, as another side stream, we'll have a lignin and lignin containing nanocellulose. So we were exp we were thinking to explore the possibilities to generate this kind of textile fibers, which also contain some small fractions of lignin, as it was demonstrated previously in the literature, that it also somewhat contributes to the antimicrobial activity. So we will try different combinations and we will be obviously reporting our findings. So please check our webpage and communication channels later on. Thank you. Thank you for, for answering that question. Um, let's go back to Kuhn. There were like two more questions for you in the chat. The first one is, you mentioned potential EU regulation. Is there anything on the horizon that would restrict continued use of the current fiber materials in marine environments? Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, June 2020, we started off with Glaucos. In July 2020, uh, together with NEN, I was invited to go on a standardization request, which was actually asked by DJ Mari from the European Commission, which had the title Circularity, Recyclability of Fishing Gear and aquaculture equipment and i am now actually the chairman of that standardization committee tc466 we will finalize this standard in november 30th of 2024 so yes there will be legislation is it really legislation that's a big question we call it a standard but actually it is a guideline. But we want to proceed in, in talks with the European Commission to make this actually happening like, okay, we help you on circularity, on recyclability. Is biodegradability and biobased included in that? Yes, it is. Um, but as indicated already, it is not mandatory and it will be for each state addressed we hope in the same way but we know already for a fact that each country will actually address it in a different way okay thank you for your answer and um, another question to you is can we coat the coir ropes using bio-based coating Will there be a big solution? Will it be a big solution to fishing gears, especially to overcome fooling? How did you test the fooling resistance of your product? Otherwise, in our, on our side, we need your solution to collaborate. <laughs> um, the, the coil ropes, the core ropes, um, bio-based coatings to put on ropes as indicated yes in order to make fishing gear also yes to overcome fouling as indicated for the moment people work with copper based so copper dioxide coatings yeah um, which will be banned in the future because they leach out otherwise they don't function and that's called anti-fouling within our company we never use this name so the nets you saw in the field in fouling restraining. So we call it fouling restraining because we don't want to kill. We want actually the species as well, fauna and flora, not to adhere and be scared of the products we use and which will be non-toxic and non, uh, uh, would say, showing up on the DGP list. Yes, we have products hopefully this year, which will be used in aquaculture environment in the field tests to show if we can improve the following restraining activity of 
our codings. Thank Do you, you need Paul. to um, apply it on the core? I think during my presentation, I indicated what is important is what is wearing off. So if those microplastics will biodegrade, that's actually the aim and the challenge. So putting it into the core of a net or a rope has no issue or no sense. It's the surface which matters. Thank you for, for answering that question. And also a final call to our audience. If you have more questions, please do type them in the chat now. Um, if there are none, then I would like to thank all our speakers um, for their presentations. Um, I found them very interesting, I hope, and I'm pretty sure our audience did too. And um, yeah, I will then bring back my presentation to share with our audience some up upcoming activities of the Ecosystex community and, and future events of other Ecosystex member projects. So thank you. And um, I will bring back my it was a pleasure and hope to see all Happy the people present in this webinar at Tech Textile in April. Okay, so thank you. Okay, my presentation is loading. That's strange, but yes, now you should see it. That's great. Um, well, we just finished our Q&A and as mentioned, I would like to point out some upcoming activities and events. As a matter of fact, we already have the next Ecosystex Insight Series scheduled for the 8th of March, so in almost a month. And we will yeah, share the agenda and registration link on our channels in the upcoming days. The next one afterwards is at the end of May and after a summer break, we will be back in late September. On our member, uh, member side, we have the Biolush project and the CBEJU present at the second annual World Biopolymers and Bioplastics Innovation Forum. And two final events of member projects, namely the Silpas project is coming to an end and is organizing an online event on the 5th of March about the state of play and possible future developments of the digital product passport. And the new cotton project is organizing uh, in collaboration with Taylor Value a concluding seminar on exploring the future of circular textiles in Espos on the Helsinki area in Finland. And we will share these slides with you afterwards so you will be able to access all the registration links. On our member news site, there's also, of course, a lot of stuff happening. So, for example, did the Skirt project launch an interactive tool to learn more about the ways that you shop, which you can try out? T-Extended recently launched their community of practitioners for sharing. Um, knowledge related to textile circularity and the IRIS project that works on safe and sustainable by design published two new papers on the takeaways from safe by design and uh, value chain analysis. And if you want to stay in the loop about these member news and future Inside Series events, uh, you can subscribe to our mailing list and my colleague Charlotte will drop a link for you to sign up there in, in the chat in any moment. Um, and finally, I would also like to bring to your attention what we hear at Text and Biobased Textiles Innovation mm -hmm. Hub, which brings together European textile sustainability experts across the industry, from research organizations to companies that have an interest in circular and bio-based innovation. We will officially kick off the rollout of the first webinars next week and have great activities planned um, for this year, including different learning webinars, networking opportunities online as well as offline, and also collaborative online workshops. 
So I invite you to check out the program on our website and also there uh, for our Innovation Hub, Charlotte posted all the relevant links for you in the chat and we do hope to see you there. And with all this um, information being shared with you, we're coming towards the end of our webinar, a bit ahead of time, but I'm pretty sure no one is mad about gaining some extra minutes of their day. So if you would like to stay in touch, please follow us on LinkedIn. And if you are a member of an EU-funded project yourself that works on textile sustainability and circularity, you can always get in touch with us and then we could follow up on a potential membership of your project. So yes, again, I would like to thank all our speakers and um, we hope to see you either in our next Insight Series webinar or in person at, yes, for example, Tech Textile um, to reach out to us and wishing you a lovely Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.